All right, hey everybody. So, recently came back from the 2022 fall trapping rendezvous down there in Louisiana. Great time, great people. Mm -hmm. And I recorded, like I did last uh, last time, I recorded a couple of the demos. And I got permission to post them. So, here we go. We're going to post them. So, this first one right here, this is going to be Jeff Allegard with his mink trapping demo. And Jeff is a trapper down from Louisiana. He traps crawfish ponds. And uh, dude really knows what he's talking about. He's a great snaresman, a great just general trapper. But uh, his mink trapping demo is going to be a little different than what a lot of guys are used to when it comes to mink, especially a lot of northern guys. So um, not really talking about using much bait, not really talking about using pockets, mainly blind sets, but lots of great info. It was a wonderful, wonderful um, demo, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. So here we go. We've been talking by for him all year, but he's ready to go whenever and we're ready to go, to tell you the truth. But we're going to go on a Friday evening and stay there Sunday, you know, stay the whole weekend, don't even leave. And we go up by boat and ain't got to worry about somebody walking in. They're going to have to get the only way to get over there near. Jeff Aguilard, I'm from Melton. It's down in uh, Allen and Jeff Davis Parishes. Where I'm from and where I trap is mostly wide open rice prairies, crawfish ponds few trees maybe along the bayou, but for the most part it's open ground. Down there there's a lot of mink, enough to cause problems, you know, like ADC level mink. Getting into crawfish traps, just causing trouble. And while this doesn't exactly look like a crawfish pond, it is similar in some ways in that there are going to be specific parts to focus on to get the most return on your time. If I were going to a pond like this, you would want to look for corners like this. You want to look for places that another attractive uh, feature is nearby, uh, say like the corner of another pond would be right there. So I would check for trails and evidence, you know, at those corners. They love tall grass. Things that rabbits like, mink like. They get cover from predators. They get mice and small things they can hunt. And a mink is really home whenever it's in little tunnels, grassy tunnels and whatnot. A lot of people in the rest of the country use baited sets for mink, uh, pockets and whatnot. Down here, I choose to mostly, almost exclusively, use blind sets for several reasons. One, it's so hot, mink spoils very quickly here. You all know that. The fire ants, the possums, you know, if I can see where they're traveling, I don't need to try to bait them. They might be looking for love and not interested in eating. And if you can find that trail and block it, you can catch them. Right here, I made a trail shaped like a Y to represent what it could look like coming to a pond. Something that I do is I try to heavily set or gang set trails because I may be trying to catch mink, but possum come and whatnot. So I've set plenty of traps. Right here, the trail splits into a Y, and a person could set a trap on each side, but I choose to get them before it splits because they may go left and may go right, but they're for sure using this trail. So I'll put a trap here, a trap there. If I had more pinch points, I'd put traps till I ran out of pinch points. I don't just set traps anywhere out in the open. I look for good spots. If this were actually happening in the field, I would absolutely have a trap there because I want them to be used to squeezing between things, not that I'm introducing things. They're used to making this turn every Tuesday as they come through. And whenever I slip in a trap, I want him to, to, to feel like he's, you know, it's every day for him. I do blend my body grips any chance I get. Uh, whatever I have nearby, the grass, I'll fold it over. Whether or not that makes a difference, I'm not sure, but I know it doesn't hurt. So I blend it and it's, it's a tunnel for them to shoot for. Bang, bang. And if you wanted to, you could put a third one. Whenever I set traps for mink, it's usually January and February because they are really running hard that time of year. That's, they call it their rut. Mm -hmm. And I will key in on large drainages, look at Google Earth, 
to see what big ditches connect multiple crawfish ponds, lead to bayous and whatnot. On an entire farm, I might have one place that I stop my truck and set traps on the whole farm. But if I'm doing that, I think that everything is coming through there like the way interstates meet. In crawfish ponds, these things really are like interstates because you have a well manicured flat terrain with the highest elevation being their farm road right next to the lowest elevation which is the man-made lateral big canal ditch. So you have high ground, you have low ground and then in between that you have the tall grass that couldn't safely mow. So it leaves a stretch of cover for the mink to run and for them to have cover from predators, to have mice, it's perfect. So you find these trails, if this were the ditch and that were the road, this would be what I'm referring to. And you would find little tunnels, they look like little, little rat tunnels, just going through. And if you locate where there's pinch points, where these trails intersect, you can hammer them. At a single location, I will find every trail that I can. Like I said, this might be my only stop. So on the high ground, I'm trying to block down their movement. On the water edge where they're hunting, I'm trying to block it down. In the middle, wherever. I might have 10 or 15 traps set at one spot. And you might have five or six catches when you make one stop. The reason why I focus on this is because driving down the road, you'll find single trails with mink traps. If I set traps there, I might get a mink the first night. I might get one in five nights. But every time I'm stopping, I'm stopping to wait for that mink to move. When you're setting travel corridors, you're getting mink that weren't even living there passing through. You know, running their circuit like they say. And I just feel like that's a much better approach. If I have the opportunity, I will wait to set my traps right before a weather event. It's usually hot here. If I had a fur coat, I wouldn't be moving either. But whenever you get that snap where it's 30 degrees, 40 degrees, raining and whatnot, they need to move. They need the calories. They feel good. Their food's moving. Rain, everything is happening. And I set my traps right ahead of that. And I'll usually run my traps for about five checks or so. And whenever I stop catching, I pull my traps. I don't keep going to check empty traps there. I may move to a new spot but that spot, as far as I'm concerned, is done. Uh, you know, because you want to get a return on your time. This trail right here represents a trail that they're hunting the edges. Edges and corners, intersections, those are all very important. So if raccoons, mink, whatever, they're walking this water line around the pond, I could set traps anywhere, but where these trails meet, that it's like setting at an intersection it is so I'm setting a foot trap here I'm setting a foot trap here and I'm catching them walking to the water I'm catching them coming this way and honestly if this trail is really what I was looking at I would be able to put a few body grippers in here because there's cover here on a bare bank I don't really mess with that but that's what I would look for I know it's a lot to take in, but I'm trying to, trying to fit it in here. To come over here, it's maybe not what people think of whenever they think of mink trapping. But one of my best locations is actually like a rabbit patch. The grass is like this tall, and there are rabbit trails everywhere. And I'll just go through finding where <clears throat> two trails meet into one, and I'll set two traps, or three traps. Boom, 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 like that. And I guess they're running, looking for mice. They could probably take down a rabbit because we have large bucks down in the south uh, Louisiana. But uh, in a rabbit patch the size of this right here, I might pick up two or three mink in a couple of days time and then move on. Um, it doesn't take a large amount of grass to be attractive to them, but you'll find out pretty quick uh, you know, what they like. Um, in my experience, finding a spot on a ditch, like around a culvert, where there are lots of holes and crap, a lot of times I'll get a female there, you know, a little smaller, 
because that's where she's hanging out. But whenever I'm setting these banks, catching the runners, it seems like I get many more bucks to the does or females that I catch. Um, I stretched out this to fit this in also. I'm sure plenty of y'all have seen this. This is an adjustable slider. You can use them on land or in water. And you anchor both ends and you use this toggle to attach to the swivel of your trap. So if I wanted to pick up a coon here, but I don't want him to destroy the area, I would anchor that there and the other end wherever I want him to go. And whenever he hits this, he goes one way, but he can't come back the other because a coon will make a mess. Any animal that's alive is gonna make a mess. And that's one of the reasons why I like body grips because a good catch, I can use the, the place over and over that exact spot. If a coon or something does destroy my area and mash it down to where they can easily walk around, that set becomes a set down the road. I don't try to rebuild a spot if it gets all torn up. Um, if this was just a river or a bayou, you could set pockets. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with those, but it's just digging a little pocket, a little hole into the bank and putting fish in the back with a foothold in the front. I've used them, but I don't use them much. But if you're not able to identify these places that they're using, it's an option you have. Because mink, if you watch one, they check out everything. So if you can't nail down where they're going, you may want to have something to attract them. But look for the grass. The grass is the key in South Louisiana with the mink. The otter too. You know, I'll catch dry otters uh, on these trails too at times. My first, my first otter ever was actually in that rabbit patch I told you about. You wouldn't think it, but they were cutting across. You have any questions? Anything I can? <clears throat> you, you said earlier that most of the, the main travel is where you're catching with buck meat. Mm -hmm. I trap around my move to go by that area. Mm -hmm. uh, Rocker's Point. Right. I've seen several times run the levees mm -hmm. in between ponds. Right. Well, you go over there, you'll find there's a trail on top, there's a trail middle ways or to the bottom, on both sides. Where, where are you picking your spot? Because, I mean, I, I have gone down there, and it's like, if I had 200 conibears, 110s or 120s, I would not have enough to set everything. Right, that's right. So where, where are you picking your spots for that? So what I was talking about, and every pond is different. Some of them are just right for your style. Other ones are really, really hard to nail down. And what I would do in your situation, if possible, that could be a hard one. But if you track back to how that farm is drained, they may be running the levees, but there could be a large canal oh, yeah, there's, that there's, that water goes to. Right. And while it may not be exactly where you wanted to sit, that, that canal could be connecting other farms and they're running it. And if they're running it dry, they may not be leaving much of a trail. But once you see that little trail, they're gonna want the cover. So on those big ditches, a lot of times, the road will look like this, mm -hmm. and this is where you're looking. Yep. And when you find those things, uh, you got them. Secondly, in your situation of uh, drop pipes, the drains from those ponds, mm -hmm. or gold mines. I actually have a pipe in my truck. I was gonna wanna set it up. But if it's if it's right here, you can expect to have a trail running underneath it and then going over. So if this is the pond and that's the canal, chances are I'm gonna set the canal side more heavily, depending on what I see. But I would set it very heavily. Where the trail comes down, foot traps, where they're climbing up, uh, body grips, and then where they're going in the water. I mean, it's a small animal. They don't always leave a lot of sign, but they're using those drains. Because if you're, if you're where you described, it's, you pretty much can't nail it down. No, that's what I'm saying. You know, and that may be a situation where you'd want to use pockets and bait. I've tried them, and I've never caught one. 
right. only time I've ever caught was blind setting a trail. That's right. And and one of them is I saw the mink. Right. I literally saw him. So I got off my bike, went and looked, found his trail, dropped it. The trap sat there for probably five days before he came back. Right. You know, I caught him, but right. it was five days of looking at, at empty. That's right. <laughs> You know? That's right. And like, um, out of all the farms, I mean, there's where I live and probably where you live too, it's just nonstop crawfish pond farms. And what I'll do is I'll identify which ones I like the most mm -hmm. and like, that is my baby. The other ones I get to it if I have time or whatever, but the ones that you really want are going to be ones that are connected with a big man-made lateral because that means steep banks. Little canals aren't that steep. Those laterals, the big, right. deep, the right. dangerous ones, that really narrows it down because if they're in the middle, it's gonna be on a narrow ledge. You see what I'm saying? So, for your answer, I guess I would go to where that pond's draining and, you know, maybe other ponds too. Is this your pond or somebody no, else's? No, it's, it's a former. It's... I'm sure they're all happy to have you. Yeah. So, yeah. find the ones you want, you know? Yeah. And sometimes it's even small ditches. If you look at a map, how these these ponds are drained, if this was the whole farm and the ditches run like this, I'm gonna go where the ditches intersect and just look around. You'll start seeing their turd. If you're finding lots of their turds, you're in a hot spot. Right, see, that's <coughs> the two places, one of them, and they, they were probably nearly a mile apart. It's same former, different set of forms. Yeah. One was the, the buck mink, I caught, I saw it. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I saw it, so I went and found this trail, set it. Another one, I was walking down 11, I said, oh, like, you see the trail that comes into the water, I set it right there, ended up catching a female. Right. But that was the only two. And I, and I know for, for a fact there's way more than that right. there. It's to find out, like I said, every every levee. Right. Every right. levee, every road has trails. It's That's just right. to find out. I focus on the drains. Right. The drains and the intersections, you know, where they, where they intersect. Anything else? Size oh, you trap got a question. Is no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> what, do you, what, what size trap is that? That's... So this is a number one. Okay. Uh, foothold. <clears throat> um, I like long springs. I like coil springs. These just happen to be coil springs. Mm -hmm. You set those on drowners, or are you just leaving? Most of the time, whenever I set footholds for mink, I just have it stake. Um, I don't use submersion rigs a lot, other than with beavers. Mm -hmm. But uh, with mink, I usually have it set that, or like on a uh, like on a clog or a drag, you know, a stump or a big metal plate, right. plow blade, whatever is mm -hmm. handy, something like that. So you run straight wire triggers? Do you use circle triggers? You find a difference? Well, Okay, so I usually use factory triggers, but I bend them into uh, like a wishbone shape, like this. Yeah. When you're using like the 110s other than BMI, I think their triggers are too short, so you don't have much to work with. So on a 110, I'll do a V on the bottom, but with a 160, I have more room it seems to be able to shape it. I do like circle triggers, but I like the wishbone too. Um, for beavers, I always do dog on the bottom, but for me, a lot of the times the 160s, I do it like this and I have grass across the top. Have you messed with any of the Conor Bear pans? Not too much. I have a 330 in my truck with a pan, but I don't use it that much. Uh, if I ran like the baited, uh, cubbies and whatnot, I might, but you know, I'm sure they're good. I mean, it makes sense for them to land on it, mm -hmm. but I just, in my style, I choose to set traps where they're forced through and I haven't felt I needed it. So, what about, what about snares? Do you snare any or, or so? Um, the... I've snared a few, I enjoy it. Kind of body grip kind of bears are very efficient, they're easy to set. You know, snares are a one-time deal. I love snares for beavers, but with me, I really reach for a 160 or like a 115 or a 110. Uh, 
snares and footholds, I'll use them, you know, if I have extra time or I want to. Right. But for the snares, I like 364, and I do prefer a 1x19, mm -hmm. so the 7x7. Seven seven. Yeah. 364th instead of the 160? Yeah, I like it a little bit smaller. And okay. well swiveled. Okay. Um, they roll a lot, yeah. so I have to put a swivel close. You end up dispatching a lot of them with that snare, or is they usually I mean, alive? I have to dispatch them. They're not. Oh, so the snare usually doesn't. No, it doesn't. They're pretty tough. <laughs> what tells me they're rough kicking off? I mean, that's what I was always told, and I see an increase in activity. I catch lots of bucks. It makes sense. I have nothing scientific to back that. I'm I just saying. The first dead male on the highway, and that's typically when it's around January. Yeah, <laughs> yeah January, middle of January to February. Middle you're January, seeing them on the road. The they're you know, lots of activity. I've seen about 10 in the road the last two days. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Around the house, you can drive down any road. You see a dead skunk here, you look at that dead mink there. Right. So any reason you like the number ones instead of a one and a half? I like the one and a half, too. That's what I had in my bucket whenever I came over here. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> uh, so one and a half isn't too big. That's, that's a good size trap. Light paying attention? Well, this is something to be clear. You know, we want to follow BMPs, mm -hmm. but we have to be realistic. Right. In a crawfish pond, it's not just me. Right. It's coon, it's possibly otter, whatnot. A one and a half and a 160 is a good balance. Right. Because if you set 110s and the coons run through, you're just getting knocked over stuff. Uh, a 220 is big for a mink. A 160 is a good, you know, in the middle for me. Um, the otters I've caught have been stone dead in a 160, mm -hmm. the tight fit, but a 160 and a one and a half, that's good traps for me for that. What's your preferred brand for conor bears? Well, with 330s, 280s and 330s, uh, I pretty much only use Bilal. It's not for any reason other than I like the way they are, I like their trigger. I buy them, I use them, I don't have to modify them, I don't have to squeeze the triggers or anything. The safeties, they're the safest trap on the market. Um, on those large traps, other brands, I do use a safety because I don't want to wear one. But with those, with their safeties, they don't swing. So I have safety, I have a good trigger. Out of the box, I can use it. I don't have to tune it and everything else. Uh, I do like the closure. It has cost me a few times, but I do like that trap. I like how it fits on my stabilizers. Whenever I squeeze it on my H stands, it's a, it's a snug fit. I'm not having to put sticks to keep it from wiggling. You know, it's just a good all around trap. Um, on my 160s and down, I do like the BMIs. Um, the Belial 160s, I don't like them very much because whenever I squeeze them tight, I can't set it upside down because it closes too tightly. For my H stands, mm -hmm. I'd have to use sticks and other things. Uh, some people use sticks. I think that metal stabilizers are one of the best investments I've made trapping. I don't have to look for the perfect stick or anything. I, I set it and I go. So when it comes to stabilizers, like what's your, what, what's like your top two stabilizers? That one right there. Everything else goes behind that right here. Okay. I like KB stabilizers. For the bigger traps but i don't like how i have to squeeze it so tight and then get sticks to keep it from wobbling and whatnot the stakealizers and the rc best where it has the uh two v's on each side they're nice but whenever i squeeze them i still have to put sticks to keep them from you know sliding and moving and, and wiggling i do put any cover i can to blend it I don't want to have to put sticks to keep it from wiggling, if that makes sense. Uh, so speaking of camouflage, how do you feel when it comes to treating your traps? Are you trying, I see you got them painted, uh, what is that, brown? I paint dip them in Rust-Oleum primer. I do about 50-50, a little bit thinner. Um, I dip them whenever it's hot outside if I can. After I dip them, I come back about 15 minutes later and I slide the dogs and I slide the, uh, the triggers. Mm -hmm. By doing that, it lets that paint behind there dry. By doing that, I don't have to put tape 
and all this other nonsense and peeling with, a, uh, with my knife to clean it off. Once it's dry, I'll hit it with uh, camouflage spray paint, khaki, green, brown. Just to break it the up. The main thing is, in my opinion, to get that primer so you don't get dirty hands, you don't have rust all over your stuff, it's clean. Whether or not the camouflage makes a difference is debatable, but it can't hurt. So... Well, do you feel it gives you some kind of advantage over somebody just has a straight black speed dip trap? Well, I mean, solid colors stand out. You know, black's hard to see when it's dark, but against a light background, black stands out like crazy. By having a camouflage, just different patterns, yes, it does blend in. Again, though, whether or not camouflage makes a difference in catches, somebody could debate it. I know it doesn't hurt, and I'm doing it for protection of the trap, and it makes it harder for humans to see. So, you know, uh, that's part of why I blend my traps, too. One, I'm making it like a tunnel for them to go through. But two, I don't want somebody to be driving down the road or whatever and want to come mess with my stuff. I want it to just be a little tunnel over there, you know? Because uh, people are curious. They'll mess with your stuff, you know? And they're hard to get off their feet. I've had people complain trying to get one of their traps off my foot because he was bringing his son to go catch some crawfish, you know? So, on, on paint, do you ever have problems with, I know a lot of people are on the scent control thing, do you feel any, you have any problems with mink scent control or with the paint? I can't say that's made a difference in my life. Uh, a big thing about scent, people talk about coyotes, I'll tell you what, they can't trick a dog when they hide any kind of contraband. They can put it in a gas tank and that dog goes right up to it. You're going to tell me you can convince a canine that you weren't around here? Yeah. No. And I tell people all the time, us trapping down here in the south, live market in the summer, we're sweating like pigs all over the set. If, I if mean, he, try yeah. not to do it if you can help it. Yeah. But I don't get, you know, overboard with, you know, the scent. Don't make any unnecessary disturbances, period, whatever that means. You know, I don't mash down the stuff around my trail. I don't, you know, make a big mess. Just Man, minimal disturbance, in and out, and you'll be good. <laughs> Whenever you find your grass edge like this right here, this edge your, your conifer set, <clears throat> how far in did you wait for setting? I start setting at the pinch points. So first, first pinch point. That's right. Whatever looks good to me. If you can get them on a slope, great. If not, just the thickest places. I will look for where I can get the most return for my sets where like the trail split, like I said, there. If they come together and then it's bare ground, then I will back off and set, you know, these, these spots. But uh, as far as for just setting a, a, a conner bear or a body grip on a bare trail, I don't do it. I would use a foothold or something. Right, yeah. But I was talking about like the grass edge. Are, are you going eight inches a foot or are you just, just to the first pitch point, whether it be six inches or two foot the tighter the better where the clumps are where you are you probably have switch grass oh yeah that's the best it's, it's a lot of this stuff right here right, this is... right. Uh, i will say this and this goes for beaver goes for mink food everything is that i want to see what kind of customers were there so if there's mink tracks i don't go on my hands and knees to get rid of them all but if there's a trail i'll wipe it clean and come back and then you're able to see did something stall at your set did something come afterwards it, it, it can't hurt you right right so you can see uh what's been going on you ever put trail cameras out just to see i mean or just too much of a hassle cameras i have put them out i don't necessarily do this for this i mean i don't have 60 trail cameras to set so uh with your footholds, are you are you burying them and stuff, or you just set them on the ground for me? How does how do you? So whenever I'm setting footholds, a lot of times I'm setting it right where the trail hits the water, uh -huh. and it's submerged. It might be on a rock, it might be in the mud, mm -hmm. but I don't just set it on the surface. Right. If I was setting like this, I would dig a, a small, just like you would. Right. Uh, a small bed. But then do you do you? 
cover it or, or I mean I would I would make an effort to, to cover it up with something. You know, I wouldn't be sifting dirt mm. and everything else over it, but uh, yeah, yeah, tear up some grass or some leaves, some dirt, just mud. A, just to camouflage it a little right. bit. Right. Gotcha. And then I'll put a stick or a rock or a piece of grass on each side to make that the most attractive mm -hmm. landing spot. But with footholds, they usually show you where to put them. Right. And you just look for that spot where they're making a change. Going over the over the log or, right. or something. That's right. And set plenty of traps. We have possums like nobody's business. <laughs> so you know, set plenty. You yeah, ever we'll put a jump stick? I have with my snares. Mm -hmm. um, for mink and for uh, squirrels, I do nothing else. Mm -hmm. But I'll put like a, you know, like a stiff stem yeah. like this. Okay. It's just something to get them to go through. Uh, for mink, probably not needed. Not needed for squirrels either, probably. But I envision them coming to that and just going through. What's the pay attention you like to run for footholds when it comes light. to mink? Light, yeah. like light. floppy pan light, or yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a small animal. Mm -hmm. uh, for beaver, I like it a little heavier, but for mink, I like it pretty light. They're light footed. You wouldn't happen to have a snare you could show us, would you? Not a mink one. I'd have some beaver snares in my truck. But, uh, I got one. I can make some. I got one. I did uh, yeah. make some smaller than that. Uh, I wouldn't go small than 364. We can talk about that later. Anything else? Do you put up your make or you sell them green? So I sell them green, but last year Mr. Uh, Mr. Perry said he'd like to get some whole. They don't take up much freezer space, so I'll probably just sell them like that. On, on a hoof? Whole thing. Just freeze it. Really? Yep, freeze it like that. Okay. Did you get one last year? Last year I usually got about a dollar, sometimes two. You know, on a nice bug get two. It's not much. Um, the money that I get from them usually comes from a farmer. You know, paying me a little something to, to get rid of them. Because they could be so bad down there that they're actually a problem. They get in you the trap. You get paid on both ends. Right. You know, you don't get yeah, it for the yeah, fur. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you're doing yeah. it for a dollar, you love what you're doing because you're losing money. Oh, yeah. You don't have to mess with the glands or anything, do you? I don't know. For beaver, I save pretty much everything. Uh, but for mink, I take the pelt. A skull sometimes if someone wants a skull but, yeah. just not worth it or I mean you have to weigh your time you know I have a third of a dozen kids and a job and all this and I just don't have the time for you know to be digging out 50 cents worth um, if I had a personal project for it I would or if somebody wanted it I'd give it to them uh, selling them whole to Perry maybe he's gonna get that it's gonna be good to you made a bunch of them. I hadn't got to use any of them yet. Okay. What type of lock do you use? I like a bullet lock a lot. Um, if you look up bullet locks, this is how they're set up. Usually. With mine, I put a double ferrule and I bend it back into a loop and the lock rides underneath. Um, just what I found to work for me and you know that's what I usually use but I do use them like this it's a good lock it locks up tight uh, it's actually one of the few locks I do use for me mm -hmm. is a bullet lock how are you usually supporting your snares when you're doing mink so I usually use 11 gauge wire for almost everything sometimes I use 9 or 14 but usually 11 um, so I have like a rebar stake with a nut hammered on the top and I pass my wire through the gap in there and wrap it tight, and it's all a stake and, you know, the wire. It's so like a little bitty kill pole looking thing? Sometimes, yeah. Some of them are like that. Um, I 
project that I made probably four or five years ago. I made some quote kill poles for me. They weren't dead, <laughs> you know. So I just looked at it as something they're tangling up on and making a mess. Um, I like to use earth anchors or stakes flat, and you know they're going to mash down everything. But they're tough. It's you know it's kind of like a little otter. So about how when you're putting your snares in your trails, about how how yeah, how how are you setting them off the walking surface? I mean, I can't give you an exact, but I eyeball it, you know, about like where the chin would be, mm -hmm. you know, something small like that. So you're not even trying to, you're not worrying about like trying to net catch them. You're just trying to just catch no, them anyway. I, mean, I, I make a loop, I make a loop about this big and I set it in a little tight spot and I'll lean in things just like with that to make it, this is their, this is what they're shooting for. This is off the ground and it's, you know, catching you need to catch them with a seat belt or a neck usually, or you're going to have a bigger mess on your hands, but you do what you can. And you're, you, you're loading all your stuff pretty oh, heavy, yeah. right? Yeah, they're, they're pretty heavily loaded. Um, so whenever I make mine, if this is my loot, my swivel's about right here. Um, and then I have my extension afterwards, but I keep it short. And you're using a barrel swivel or are you using yes, a snare? I, use, I use, mostly use barrel swivels. This is what you call a barrel swivel. Yeah, the little uh, Roscoe ones. Mm -hmm. um, so, Mink, you use a real, real small, I mean, yeah, yeah. not much bigger than their head, obviously. Everything that I snare, I make it to where there's the loop and then a swivel as close as possible. Gotcha. So, if this was my beaver snare, like this would be an otter or a coon snare for me. And that's what I that's what I made those for coons. Right. That's perfect size for coon or otter. But uh, most people seem to like these sleeves, like almost everybody. I use the universal collars, twist little stones. Chris, Christmas tree looking things, little yeah. twist stones. Yeah. No one else likes them. I love them. <laughs> mm -hmm. I put them on everything from eighth inch to three sixty fourth. Mm -hmm. It fits all wire sizes. So I can buy one thing and rig it up with everything. Right. The mm -hmm. only time that I run into trouble is in really small cable. If I'm trying to use like 14 or 16 gauge wire, I'll have to fold it over and pinch it, make it bigger. But uh, you asked about my wire. I even use tie wire, 16 gauge, whatever's handy. You know, if I don't have some, I'll stop at the hardware store and that's what they have. And I'll just double or triple it mm -hmm. and squeeze it tight. Uh, Whatever I'm doing though, the wire is not moving. The only thing that moves is your lock. If everything's sloppy, you're not gonna get good results. Also, don't coat my stuff either. Um, all of my snares, all of them, I make them and I lightly spray paint them. To get rid of the silver and everything, I don't dip them in anything. If that works for y'all, great. Just kind of dust them. Just a dust, mm -hmm. like that. And they still fire quickly. And uh, some of these snares that have been coated that I handled, there's just this gumminess to them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I don't like. I don't care for it. Cool. And you're just anchoring your snares with with, uh, with a stake or earth anchor. Or... So almost all of my snares for everything uh, is either with. An extension cable for like around a tree for a coyote mm -hmm. or pig or a wolf fang. Um, a few of my snares I make for beavers to put on my snare poles will have a swivel or something else because I'm attaching it to that. For the most part, I like an earth anchor on my snare extension because I can use that snare extension uh, with the earth anchor. I can use it as an extension. It's all in one. I make one snare and I can use it as an earth anchor. I can put it around a tree. You have options. I'm all about mm -hmm. having options. Mm -hmm. uh, so. What about cable size? Is that a good size for mink or is that too Yeah, heavy? I mean 1 uh -huh. and 3 64th, either one's pretty good. I prefer 3 64th. Okay. Um, I do like 1 by 19 because with it being stiff, you can take advantage of getting that energy right. whenever you load it and make it fire. Mm -hmm. Uh, and for beavers, I like 119. I like 119 for everything, but I do like 7x7 seven seven for coons and uh, coyotes, just out of preference. Mm -hmm. No real reason other than I like it. You know, 
you don't find a coyote to a uh, seven by seven too bad? I mean, coyotes go crazy on anything, but uh, <laughs> well, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. You know, without having that center core. Right. I mean, I try to I try to get them dispatched as soon as possible. You know, with the tree, tangle up things, right. give them some right. slack. Um, I will say this: that with with beavers, I only remember having broken cable using seven by seven. I don't think I've ever had a one by nineteen. It can happen. But, and I've had some mangled ones. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can recall three times I had a broken snare on a beaver, and all three times it was seven by seven. Yeah. Uh, they're just able to get it in the bind, get that swivel to stop, and. What about can... otters? What size cave we use for that? So I don't set snares for otters very often. Yeah. Uh, the ones that I make for people and what I would use would be 564. Uh, that's a good all around cable. Good all around cable. That's what I like. So is there a particular, like, when I say type of cable, so I know some people only like Korean cable, some people don't want. Is there a certain type you like to go for, or a certain place you buy yours you prefer? Yeah. So I bought my cable from quite a few places, and I've been satisfied with all of them. They say it's Korean. As long as it's quality cable, it has a good cast memory. It's not corkscrewing. Right. If it's corkscrewed, it doesn't matter where it's from. But um, I buy from the snare shop, I buy from Newt, I buy from Rally. Stop selling. Uh, Dakota line. I've been satisfied with all of them. And with your what, with your barrel swivels, do you just use one size barrel swivel for most things, or? So um, my my <coughs> component box is a stowaway, about like this, with lots of little compartments, and I pretty much have every size swivel, lots and lots of locks for mink. And beaver and most things, like a six aught or so, is usually what I'm going to use. I do have eights. I don't mind if I have an eight. What I'm saying is whatever I grab is okay with me. Um, when you start getting smaller than this, though, if you tie into something big, there can be stress damage to it. Uh, I've never had a broken swivel. I have had a 10 or 11 aught stretched a few times with pigs, but they're in a league of their own. Yeah. So uh, you only use Ro the Roscoe ones? Yeah. Or? Pretty much. So, um, I, I, I run that size on my uh, limb lines for catfish, and so that, that's how those end oh, up yeah. on those snares. <laughs> this is like 600 pound test right yeah. there. Mm -hmm. But with that said, it's probably not a good idea to just use heavy duty looking barrel swivels you get at like Walmart, right? You want them to spin and not bind. Before I use one, I'll take it and I pull, and if it stops on me, to the, to the, I, have a, I have a bucket. All my junk goes in there. <laughs> Because if it binds, I don't want that. And um, in some of the cheaper fishing swivels, you'll find that. There's like a burr in there. Binds, throw it. Roscoe's, I don't, you never have that problem. So it's high quality. Just bite the money in. Do you ever have problems with like with them like rusting or getting corrosion on the inside of that barrel and not working anymore? No, I can't say that I have. Um, it's brass. Mm -hmm. I believe it's painted brass. And I've never had that problem. Like I said, oh, Swivels are pretty much a one-time use deal, right? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, uh, you can reuse oh, no. them? Man, I have some shiny ones. You use them over and over and over and over. I'm not talking about the barrels. I'm talking about the the, the whole swivel unit. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. I said that wrong. Snares. Yes. Snares are one-time yeah. use. Yeah, for the most part. The wire's some... going to get all kinked up and stuff. There are some, if you're really tight, you can make them work. Mm -hmm. But I want it to be the best it can be every right. time. And, and wire's uh, cheap. <laughs> right. It is. And that's another reason why I put my swivel up close. Mm -hmm. Because I'm only cutting that much off. Right. Reuse the and you can reuse the swivel, you can reuse the lock, you just put new wire on it. The only thing that I've had wear down with the locks with pigs, um, most locks I'll get, in my experience, two or three pigs on it before it starts to show wear. Mm -hmm. Other than that, in other animals, just reuse it over and over and over. Yeah. But, I mean, like I said, pigs are, that's a whole separate, it's like snagging vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> mentioned the BMIs earlier. You still finding those? No, I haven't bought any BMIs in years. Um, their website's gone since COVID. Even when their website was up, they were they were kind of difficult to get. But um, you know, I'd email them, I'd call them, and stick with them because I like their product and yeah. I love their prices. Yeah, it was. I, I love them. They're, I had probably a dozen and a half one tens. Right. Love them. I actually added a second spring to make them one twenties to them. Right. Just, just for the ease of setting them, right. you know. 
I loved it. American made, great yeah. triggers, great, great traps. Yeah. If you miss with any of those, um, they're Canadian made one. They're not Bilal's. They got they got the Sam breaker, Joe. the sat the Savu. No, I yeah. haven't. Okay. Uh, I have a hard time believing I'd like it more than Bilal's. I really like Bilal's. I was wondering because some of the Canadians say that the Bilal's are like their dukes. So yeah. they can say that I like them. <laughs> <laughs> I will I wish say, they were priced like dudes. I'm telling you. Yeah. But uh, if you paint them and take care of them, they'll last and last and last and last. Their factory triggers do break soon. Uh, whenever I buy Belial 330s, I twist them into a T and I use them. And then one side of the T breaks after so many catches. And then I change it and I put uh, tension wire. I think people call it phone wire. It's like. That 11 gauge it's shiny super stuff. Super stiff. Yeah. And um, I have never had one of those fail. And I have some that are probably, shoot, time flies, probably five years old. I mean, they're quality. American made wire from the 50s is my grandpa's. <clears throat> but Belisle's trigger wires are, they're thin and they're kind of brittle. You know, they, they break. So, one more thing lure, with mink lure. Do you, I know you say you don't use bait, but is there any type of lures that you've ever messed with that you found actually kind of work? I can't say that. I have used mink lure. I can't say one way or another whether it worked for me or not, because to me, the best lured set would have been a great blind set. And chances are, if I was using lure, I was already putting it where they were passing. Mm -hmm. And I can't say whether or not, if I hadn't used anything, if I'd have caught it or not. Uh, you know, like I said, my approach is to take advantage of their movement and food and everything else takes a back seat. Uh, mink lure is one of those things like otters. Some people swear the lure works, some people swear it doesn't. I don't know. I take advantage of their movement. So I know mink are predatory. And like you were saying earlier, they come up and down. Have you ever tried like flagging them some type of, some type of way? Like you see a trail or something and you have a blind set and you put, I don't know, a feather or some like a, I don't know, some, something up the bank that makes them want to come up and investigate and come up that trail or? No, I haven't. Um, if I wanted to get their attention, I'd make a mess. Something that catches their eye. Um, and like I said, for the most part, it's trails and tunnels and tight spots. Um, you, if I find a bunch of tracks, I'll track it to where get in my zone where I'm getting them, you know, in a tight spot. Because uh, like under bridges and stuff, there can be tracks everywhere and they could be months and months old. Because they made prints and it's just not getting rained on and whatnot. That's another reason to wipe it. Because if you find a bunch of tracks under a bridge, you don't know when they're from. So I wipe it clean and then if I come back and there's tracks, I know I'm, I'm looking at something here. But no flagging. Honestly, most of the flagging that I've done has been to mark my sets. Um, you know, whenever I've caught bobcats using flagging tape, that was for me, really. It just happened to be a bobcat underneath it. So. Cool. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Appreciate it. Very good. Very good.